that information and put it back out there. Now, there's been a major change in the head. The head itself, this was done for simplistic reasons to make it look like this. On the website that I told you earlier, forensicspeak.com, there is a link to what IBM has made that is the new GMR head of the platters itself. And the head has changed quite a bit. And they use a type of metal now that they glue together that can read differences in magnetic information as it passes under it. And it's very complicated. So this piece was done for simplicity to try to give you an idea of how this data is written back and forth. Now, as time has gone on, they needed to write more data to the drive. So any drives that have been larger than 16 gigs have started to use this new head so that they can write more and more data to it. Now, for those of those you can't see that, those are flipping bits. So the bits themselves, as you are writing and the aerial density increases, they started having problems reading more and more data from it to the point that the ECC on the board didn't even help to be able to correct errors. So they'll have bits at different places that will flip just because of the environmental items that are going on around it. So there's been this big push to try to go to a new type of recording mechanism. So this last year, we've gone to the perpendicular recording. They decided if we didn't have enough space to increase, that we could write the data up and down instead, and that we could read that bit and store more bits in the same amount of space. So that's how Seagate came out with that 750 gig hard drive. Now, this new technology that they patented the day that I released this particular presentation is called HAMR, H-A-M-R. And it's heat-assisted magnetic recording. And as the head goes across the platter in this new technology, it zaps it with a laser, which causes the lubrication on the top of the drive to evaporate. And they came up with this new idea that they can use a reservoir inside the hard drive and make a vapor and have it go back to the hard drive's platters to get lubrication back on the drive's platters while it's running. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a pretty bad idea to me. I'm thinking that as they increase this, that there's this reservoir that they claim is going to live the life of the hard drive. I don't know what life of hard drive means to them. I think in legal terms it means seven years, but in this particular instance I'm thinking warranty. Because coincidentally, the same time that they released this new information, they started their own data recovery company. <laughs> so maybe they know something we don't know. Uh, but I love Seagate hard drives, so we'll find out as they make them. But I'm thinking, you know, a year out, how are you going to know what's going to happen to that hard drive if all of a sudden you start having problems? I have not seen a perpendicular hard drive in for a recovery yet. So I don't even know what my methods are going to do for trying to do a data recovery with the changes that they've made. But my guess is because the data is so much closer together, it's going to be incredibly hard to try to get this data back. <clears throat> this is what it looks like when you're writing and reading with your OS, pretty much no matter what OS. Um, it will move quite violently back and forth across the disk. And it can move back and forth 60 times across that platter, depending on the size of your platter and where that data exists. So if you've got a hard drive that has a bad sector on it, and it's moving back and forth at that speed, and you hit that sector, it's going to constantly start giving you errors. And basically, the drive is going to slow down. You'll hear some sounds. And you may think that your system's locked up or something bad's happened. Most people don't have a lot of patience with them. So even if it was going to recover, it may error out, and your system may crash or blue screen before you can do anything about it. If you're going to do a recovery, one of the ideal methods to do this is going to be imaging. You're going to try to do an image from beginning to end. The downside to this is that something like Ghost or something that really can't recover from errors in the process is basically going to die in the middle of doing this. So from a software perspective, you have to have some software that at least knows how to handle some of the basics of retrying and going through that process, or at least saving the amount that has already imaged as it's writing across the disk. The, if you're using a RAID controller and you have a RAID failure, imaging is a must because you cannot read the data. You cannot mount it in the OS and go after those, those files. So you have to image it using some software, whether it be DD or something that's a, 
uh, a little bit more redundant and able to write out the pieces that you've already saved. So my suggestion would be there's a couple of free packages out there that do some things, some for Linux, some for Windows, some for Macs, and uh, there should be some ways of trying some of this stuff before you have to go through this process. But there is a program called Test Disk that has basically been written for most of these applications that can go in and try to read sectors and retry and do things like that. And it's also listed on ForensicSpeak.com. <clears throat> so one of the basics that we're going to do now with trying to reassemble the hard drive is we need to go through some of the items that I think are a little bit different that you might not be aware of. And so we're going to go through how I break down what kind of errors that I'm dealing with. Because if you have a, a scratch platter, in most cases, there's not going to be much you can do about it. So I break these down into two, two different categories. By software, I mean that in most cases, when you do a recovery, you might be able to use the OS to get your data back. You might be able to switch back and forth between different OSs to read the data. But it's going to be something that doesn't really require you to open the hard drive or to get parts and replace them. So 85% of all the hard drives that I get in for our recoveries are some method like this. For instance, a Mac. A, a Mac hard drive, I get a number of these where someone has one Mac and their hard drive died. They got there's thousands of pictures on it. They, maybe they have another Mac and they go and they plug this hard drive into the Mac and it can't mount it or read it either. But there are some simple methods that you can use, say use Windows with Mac drive or something on it. It will mount a lot of damaged Mac OS drives. For some reason, there are some things that even Mac can't recover or repair from that you can plug into something else or boot on a Nopix disk and try to read the partition or something along those lines. And it may even skip some of the errors that are already occurring. Hardware is the big one. And that's basically what we're talking about here. So I'm going to break hardware down into these categories. Most of the items that we can do are just with the electronics itself, the IDE board. So if you're able to find this board that matches exactly what you are looking for with the firmware, it's easy to pop off four screws, put this board on, and go for it. And in most cases, even if you've got the wrong board, you can try it, and it won't do any more damage to your hard drive. It just won't work. So sometimes two boards or three boards might be the trick here, depending on what, what firmware is on those boards and where they came from. So sometimes it's worth shopping eBay, especially for these older drives, because in some cases you can order them on eBay and get them for 20 bucks or something and maybe actually get a recovery done. But that's a, that's a good 10%. So if 85% is software and 10% is hardware, that's 95% of your drives right there that you can somehow get data back using one of, those, one of those formats. The heads and the platters are put together because sometimes the heads and the platters cause each other's problem. And so you have to treat them simultaneously. And then the motor, which I described earlier, is very difficult to deal with. So these are the laws, according to Scott, that I try to teach some of my employees when we're trying to do something to try to get. Now, the first one, don't be emotionally attached. Listen, guys, you do not need your porn back this week. <laughs> you, can, you can wait another week. <laughs> so the other one is damaged hard drives. Do not do the same thing twice. I get all kinds of hard drives that one day of the week they do one thing, the next day of the week they're doing a completely different thing. I had a situation where I had a hard drive I struggled with every day, all week long, and I still could not get it to mount or do anything. And I plugged it into a machine and I just went home frustrated on a Friday, came back on Monday. It took it a while, it was acting very, very slow. Part of the reason is because the heads have to keep retrying whenever there's an error. Sometimes it works itself down to a smaller piece of data that's not corrupt, and then it actually will mount and you can do something with it. So in some cases, plugging it in, leaving it for three or four days, you come back, it actually is functioning, but you can't, you, it's not going to be fast. There's no data recoveries that I can think of that are extremely fast unless it was just like your partition got corrupt, you can image it and go back and carve it out with some data readers or something along that line. Persistence is not futile. The, the persistence is that same thing. It ties directly to your hard drive doesn't do the same thing twice. So sometimes when you're